Lord, we confess that apart from you, we have no wisdom. We have no understanding. Lord, we need you to do a work in our hearts today. Lord, this world often drains so much from us. We need you to fill us with your love. Lord, grace us with your presence. Move in our hearts. Renew our minds. Transform our lives. Help us, Lord, to be the light in the darkness, to boldly share the hope of salvation that we have. Lord, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for your mercy, for your grace. Lord, we thank you that you never give up on us, that you are always good and always faithful, even when we fall so short. Be with us tonight as we study your work. Open our minds and our hearts and give us understanding. Let everything done here tonight be for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, so tonight we're going to be in verses 7 through 11. Our life is fleeting. Are you giving your best to Jesus? Our tomorrow is not guaranteed. Are you living for him today? If there is anything that I could stress, it would be the urgency of what God has left us here to do. We must be staying prepared, sober-minded, vigilant, ready, and willing. The call has always been to pick up our cross, to deny ourselves, and to follow where our Savior leads. You know, our time may be short, but far be it from us to go out without a fight. Let me remind you that everything good in life is worth fighting for. If we want to grow in God's word, we have to fight against our tendency to be lazy. Amen. If we want to grow closer to Christ, we have to fight against our tendency to stray away and be worldly. If we want to see others coming to faith in Christ, we have to boldly share the gospel and fight against our tendency to fear. Mm -hmm. We have to fight for our families. We have to fight for what is right and good. And our war is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the evil spiritual principalities of an unseen world. We can't be those who sit idly by as we watch people die without hope as we watch people perish without Christ? Being comfortable is far too overrated, and we need to step out in faith. We need to take a stand for truth. We need to get out of our comfort zones so that we will live for what has true eternal purpose. So often we get discouraged because maybe we feel we bring so little to the table but let's not despise humble beginnings, our simple acts of faith done in love, because God does mighty things through those who will simply have faith. It's not about what we can do, but it's about faith in what God can do. And we need to be like the disciples and cry out, God, increase my faith. That we would believe and not doubt. That we would seek God with our whole heart, living each day as if it was our last, because sooner or later, reality is, it will be. I want to switch gears for a moment, and I want to ask you a very serious question. If today you were diagnosed with cancer, would the stuff that you're worrying about in your life right now even matter, or would it all wash away? If today, you found out that you only had a few mere weeks to live, would your perspective of life completely change? Think of everything that's going on in your life, how you're living, what you're living for, how you treat others. Is it a reflection of Christ? Is your heart and your mind set on the eternal purposes of God? Or are we allowing ourselves to be distracted by something that's only temporary? I don't know about you, but I don't want to be someone who just goes to church. But I want 
to be someone who lives a life of worship to God. Amen. I want my life to point to Christ. I want my heart to glorify Christ. I want my words to tell others about Christ. I want Jesus to be glorified in my life. No matter what tomorrow holds, I want to live for him today. I cannot stress enough the urgency, the importance, the desperation of the times that we live in. Soon our life will come to an end. Every day is important and has purpose. What we live for matters. How we live matters. And don't forget, those people we pass by every day, they matter. Amen. It's up to us to be telling them about Christ, to be telling them the truth, and to be living in a way that reflects the hope that lives within us. Amen. It's time for us to wake up, to be clear-minded and sober, watchful, so that we do not fall into the traps of the enemy, but may we stand firm in faith, dedicated, devoted, bringing everything in prayer to the Lord, seeking Him, seeking His truth and His will to be lived out in our life. And my prayer is for God to break our hearts, to get us out of our comfort zones, and to convict our hearts for what He wants from us in our life. So let's read 1 Peter chapter 4. Verses 7 through 11 together. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So let's look at verse 7. Such a profound statement. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Make no mistake about it. It's clear the times that we live in. It's clear today that the end is drawing near. 1 John 2.18 says, Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. We don't think about that often. We kind of live with a mindset on the temporary, with the mindset on the things of this world which are perishing. If we were in the last hour 2,000 years ago, today, maybe we could say we're in the last minutes. I don't know exactly how that will look or exactly how long it will take, but the point is, is we should be living our life knowing that Jesus is soon to return, knowing that the end of all things is at hand. Amen. Right. Ephesians 5, 15 through 18. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Amen. We need to be wise with what little time we have left. We need to make the most of every opportunity to share Christ with others, to show love, to shine light in this dark world because the days are evil and our lives are fleeting. We don't have time to be foolish and selfish. We must be busy seeking the Lord's will, as it says, in our life. We don't have time to be lazy. We don't have time to be complacent. We don't have time to make excuses. 
we don't have time to just be amused or to go about our life as if we are all that matters. It's God's will that matters. It's his purpose that matters. Again, let's look at verse 7. Self-control and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. The King James Version says, Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Sober-minded, which we spoke on last week, one aspect is being sober from drugs and alcohol. But another aspect is not allowing our minds to be clouded with sin or to be consumed with fear and doubt and the worries of this world. Mm -hmm. So we need to get that stuff out. We need to be clear-minded with our hearts and our minds given surrendered and focused unto the Lord. This world is drunk with pride and selfishness. It's intoxicated with lust and its overwhelming desire to get and to have and, and to consume. But the world and its desires are passing away. But those who do the will of God abide forever. And as children of God, our desire is to be for Christ. And our heart and our mind is to be clean and clear and focused, ready and willing. That we would be an empty vessel set apart for God's use. Mm -hmm. Matthew 26, 41 says, Watch and pray that you do not fall into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Here in verse 7, it gives the emphasis being self-controlled and sober-minded for prayer. I don't know about you, but I believe in the power of prayer. Amen. If we don't believe in it, then why do we do it? That's right. Prayer is powerful, not because of who is praying, but who we're praying to. Amen. That's right. Amen. Nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is too hard for Him. And I believe prayer is how God has ordained certain things to happen. I believe prayer is a mighty gift from God. Prayer is how we surrender our will and get our hearts in the line with God's will. Yeah. Prayer is how we talk to God, how we worship God, seek God, and commune with God. I will say, I know we all say we believe in prayer, but if there's anything that the church today struggles with, it's getting together to pray. We're so used to being busy that one of the hardest things to do is to quiet ourselves, to quiet our minds, and just seek the Lord with our heart. As God's children, He wants us to bring everything to Him in prayer. Cast your cares unto the Lord, because He cares for you. What's interesting is when we look through the Bible, people that were used by God in a mighty way had this in common. They were dedicated to prayer. If we want that in our life, it's going to take commitment, surrender, and it's going to cost you something. There is a cost to following Christ. And there are so many who haven't counted that cost. And that's why I believe many fall away when God asks something from them or when trials and persecutions come. You see, many have come to Christ as a solution to their problems. But they didn't come to Christ for forgiveness of sin. You see the difference. They have come to Christ because they have been told that God will bless them and God will do for them. So they come for what God can give them and not to know God himself. Let me remind you, the cost that we are called to give could never compare to the cost of our sin upon the cross. And what we are called to give up in this life can never compare to what we gain in Christ. Simply put, if we want to see God's will being done in our life, we need to commit ourselves to prayer. You know when everybody else is off playing and having fun and being entertained, if we want to draw near to God, we're going to need to put those desires to the side and we need to be committed and devoting ourselves to prayer 
in God's word. Just like the song says, take time to be holy. Take time to feed upon his word. Take time to seek him in prayer. Take time to be with God's children. We must be willing to sacrifice our own comfort, our own plans, in order to submit and truly seek and live out the will of God for our lives. But in all of this, cost and surrender and sacrifice this is where joy is found. Amen. The world tells us to seek after our own desires, to do what is right in our own eyes, to look after number one. Then we will be happy. But the fullness of joy is in the presence of the Lord. That's right. Joy comes when we put Jesus first. Amen. Joy comes when we honor others above ourselves and when we think of ourselves last. If we want God to move in this church, if we want God to move in our hearts, it's prayer. And we've got to be offering our prayers with clean hands and pure hearts. There are no excuses that we can make. Humbling ourselves before the Lord and just asking for his help. To slow, to slow down long enough to hear from him. To slow down long enough to sit at the feet of Christ and learn. Our prayers need to be offered up in faith, believing and not doubting. And our prayers need to be according to God's will, according to the truth of his word. Prayer is not how we get what we want from God, but it's how we get what God wants for our life. Amen. Our prayer should, and our prayer should reflect that desire to do his will, to draw near to him to know him more, to live the holy life that we are called to live. So again, the emphasis that Peter is stating here in verse 7, wake up, the end of all things is at hand. Get your mind right, get the clutter out, get focused on God and get serious about prayer and your walk with him. I love what Philippians chapter 4 verses 6 and 7 says. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. The end of all things is at hand. This does not mean that we need to be full of fear or dread or doubt. And it doesn't mean that we stand idly by and do nothing as we nonchalantly wait for the end of all things. This is teaching us a sense of urgency, a sense of concern, an emphasis on commitment and devotion. And that devotion in particular is to prayer. Knowing that the end of all things is at hand, knowing that our time is short, that the days that we live in are evil, that persecutions are bound to come, we should be all the more diligent to live our life in the way that God has intended us to live. To be serious about our walk with the Lord. To be clear-minded. To remove all the clutter and the chaos of the world and choosing to sit at the feet of Christ. Knowing that Christ's return is imminent, this should prompt us to holy living and urge us to be diligent in the purpose that God has for our lives. However, I want to stress this one point. God wants us to do more than the right thing. And what do I mean by that? I mean that he wants us to do the right things for the right reasons. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and I surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Everything that we do 
should come from a place of worship to God, motivated by love for God, Amen. as it overflows into how we love others. Verse 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. What is the greatest command? But to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. How is it that the world is to know that we are disciples of Christ? By the way that we love one another. Galatians 6, 2 says, bear one, another, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Romans 13, 8 says, let no debt remain outstanding outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law above all here in verse 8 means that this is most important you know we can serve at the church well we can read our bible we can pray but if we're not doing these things from a place of love for god and love for people then it all amounts to nothing because our heart isn't right and the Lord isn't going to be in it. It's only when our hearts are full of God's love that we will truly love one another. And as a result, we will overlook offenses and we will be quick to forgive. And that's what it means when it says that love covers over a multitude of sins. It means that we are kind and compassionate towards one another and we forgive each other and we overlook offenses. We build each other up in love. We don't gossip and slander against one another and sow discord within the family of God, but instead we encourage one another. We forgive and we spur one another on toward love and good deeds. That is what we are called to do. So many Christians get so easily offended. We can't be those who dwell on small things until they become big things. Remember, we should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Love isn't what the world calls it. For the world does not know what love is because they do not know God, and God is love. Love is when Jesus died for our sins upon the cross. Love is more than a feeling or an emotion, but it's sacrificial action for the good of others. The most loving thing we can do is to tell others about Christ, to lay down our life, to tell them the truth even if they hate us, persecute us, to speak the truth in love, and to warn them of the wrath that is to come for all who die in their sins apart from Christ. We can't just tell part of the story. Amen. We have to tell them the true gospel. So in light of the fact that the end of all things is near, we need to be fervently, earnestly loving one another from our heart. There's no time to dwell on small offenses. We all need forgiveness, and we all need to be forgiving. We must overlook past hurts, building each other up when we fall. If our hearts are rich in the love of Christ, there will be no place for resentment and bitterness to reside. Colossians 3:12 through 14. Put on then as God as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony when we above all love it will overflow in hospitality to others verse 9 show hospitality to one another without grumbling we are called to give of what we have we are called to share what we have with others to welcome others even into our own homes and into our personal lives and we are to do it with a willing and loving heart, not reluctantly or resentfully. 
Remember, we are called to love our enemies. How much more? Our brother and sister in Christ. We are called to give and expect nothing in return, but to give freely from our hearts. If we are forced to go one mile, we are told to go two. And we are to treat others the way that we want to be treated. We are to show hospitality one to another, doing this willfully with a sincere love for our family in Christ. Not grumbling because we have to give something or open up our home or change our plans. People should never be an inconvenience. But if I were honest, and maybe if we were honest, haven't we all felt that way before? Someone shows up unexpectedly. We're called on to give of what we have. There's a last minute change to the plans and we find ourselves reluctant to show hospitality. I know there's been times in my life where though I was given the honor and the privilege to show the love of Christ, instead of looking upon that situation as an opportunity to glorify God and love, and love others, I looked at it as an inconvenience. What's interesting is the word grudging or grumbling here in verse 9 implies that this is a secret murmuring under the breath. This means that while we may do something for someone secretly in our hearts, we're not doing it out of love. We're doing it out of compulsion. Proverbs 23, 6 through 7 says, Do not eat the bread of a man who is stingy. Do not desire his delicacies. For he is like one who is inwardly calculating. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. We don't want to be stingy with a heart full of greed, but instead we want our heart full of God's love, giving freely of everything that we have. Our time, our life. If we truly and sincerely love then hospitality will follow. And maybe you're like me and need, and need to ask God to do a work in your heart. I want to be more loving and hospitable. I want to be more like Christ, sharing what we have, loving and encouraging, and encouraging each other to walk closer with the Lord. See, it's easy to be hospitable to the people we like. But we are called to extend the love of Christ to all, to love our enemies, to bless those who curse us, to do good to those who wrong us. If we're not loving each other, how can we expect to love our enemies? And yet Christ shows us how to love because he loved us when we were like that. He loved us at our weakest and our darkest. He loved us at our worst. Before we came to know Christ, we reveled in our sin. We disobeyed and we rebelled against God. Yet God, in his infinite patience and compassion, loved us even then. Mm -hmm. It is his love that covers all sin. And we are called to forgive others when they sin against us. If we could see how fleeting our time is, how close we are to the end of all things, Maybe then we would quit wasting so much of our time. And maybe then we would quit being so focused on self. Maybe then we would love without reserve, laying down our lives for the purposes of Christ, giving of what we have, knowing that our reward is in heaven. Amen. 1 John three sixteen through 18. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother and sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, speech but with actions and in truth. My prayer is that God would press upon our hearts the urgency of the times that we live in. That we would choose above all else to simply love one another. 
asking God to fill us with his love and that it would overflow into the way we live our life toward other people. Let's look at verses 10 and 11. These verses remind us that we are stewards of God, meaning that everything we have has come from God, and we are to use what God has given us for His glory, for His purpose, and for the edification of the body of Christ. A steward is someone who is entrusted to take care of that which is not His. We are managers and not owners of what God has given us. Amen. God has not blessed us just to be selfish. God has not blessed us to build our own kingdom and empire. God has not blessed us just to do what we please with what we have. God has blessed us so that we can be a blessing to others. Amen. God has blessed us so that we may shine bright in a dark and dying world, bringing the message of hope and salvation. Verse 10 and 11 reads, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the very words of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God provides in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Every breath is a gift from God. Therefore, with every breath, we should long to live for God. We are responsible for what God has given us. And we are to manage well the gifts that he has bestowed on us. We often think of stewardship when it comes to money, to tithes, to offering. But stewardship is much more than just money. Everything belongs to God. And every good and perfect gift is a gift from our Heavenly Father. Stewardship is how we live our life in fullness to Christ. Stewardship is how we manage the time God has given us, the possessions God has given us, the family, our body, spiritual gifts. To be a good and faithful servant, we must learn to be good stewards. For instance, we are to be stewards of God's word, rightfully handling the word of truth. We are to be stewards of the gospel, boldly proclaiming his love to the ends of the earth. And here, in verse 10 and 11, we are called to be stewards of the spiritual gifts God has entrusted to us. Verse 10 begins with, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. When we think of spiritual gifts, we often think of those who have the so-called extravagant gifts. The teachers, the evangelists, the preachers. But I want you to know that every gift is so precious because you are precious to God. Amen. What God has given you is valuable. It is useful. It is magnificent. It is important. There are not some gifts that are better than others. But each has a special purpose in God's eternal plan. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 through 22 says, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. That's right. I'll use this analogy. A man was rebuilding an engine, and when he had finished, he had one small part left. And he figured that since, since that was such a small part, it must just be useless. <laughs> so he went ahead and started it, and there was internal engine failure. But it's just like that in the body of Christ. Even the smallest, seemingly least important part, we will all fall apart. When one part suffers, we all suffer. Amen. When one part is honored, we all rejoice. We are to be using our gifts to edify one another, 
and to serve Christ and to fulfill his purpose. God doesn't look at the things the way we do. God doesn't judge things the way we do. The Bible says that man looks on the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. His ways are higher than our ways. Amen. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. His wisdom is beyond measure and his paths are beyond searching out. No, we are not all teachers and preachers and evangelists or whatever, but we are all important and dearly loved by God, set in place for a purpose. Therefore, let us be content with our lot in life. Let us be content with how God has gifted us, with how God has created us, with where God has put us in life, right where we are. With all that we have, whether it's a little, whether it's much, let's use it to bring God glory. God has given all of us spiritual gifts. We're responsible as stewards to be cultivating those gifts and to be using those gifts. So let me ask you, are you using the spiritual gifts that God has given you to faithfully serve his people and to fulfill the purpose that God has for your life? Don't put your gifts on the back burner. But step out in faith and use them. Remember, the end of all things is near. Our life, it's but a mist and a vapor. We are here today and gone tomorrow. If we don't step out in faith now, when will we? Are we going to wait until it's too late? Are we going to let the purposes of God pass us by? It's sad that many today have used their spiritual gifts to build their own kingdom and to bring themselves glory. But they have forgotten that judgment begins in the household of God. Amen. That God will not be mocked. A man will reap what he sows. Mm -hmm. As with all things, God's word is our guide. And it's God's word that gives us guidelines, instructions on how to use our spiritual gifts. It is very sinful to misuse the spiritual gifts God, God has given us and also not to use them at all. We don't change God's word to fit what we believe. We change what we believe to fit God's word. Our spiritual gifts are to be used to give God glory and to edify the body of Christ and anything outside of that is wrong. Verse 11. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God provides in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. When we speak, we shouldn't be quick to exalt our own opinions and preferences. But instead, we should use the gift of speaking to proclaim the truth of God's word. To proclaim the gospel. And this is especially true for preachers and teachers. When we serve, we mustn't do it in the flesh or out of vain effort, but we submit ourselves to God as we do his will from our hearts. As scripture says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but apart from him, I can do nothing. Brothers and sisters, as we look around at this world, it is clear the end is drawing near. No matter what that looks like, or how long it takes, we only live for so long. So let us live for Christ. Let us be those who acknowledge that every good and perfect gift has come from our Heavenly Father and let us use it for His glory. The message for us today is we need to wake up. We need to be aware of the times that we are living in. Amen. We need to be disciplined in prayer and in God's word. We need to get our focus off of these worldly things, and we need to be clear-minded, set apart for the Lord. Above all, we need to love each other. Above all, we need to let Christ's love rule in our hearts. Time is fleeting. Time is too short for us to be an unforgiving people. Let us forgive. Let us love. 
and let us really be focused on the eternal things, living in a way that shines light in this dark world, boldly proclaiming the truth that brings the hope of salvation that is only found through Jesus Christ. If the Lord tarries, let us step out in faith. Let us cultivate those spiritual gifts. Let us not fear, but let us trust the Lord. And let us encourage one another to walk ever closer with the Lord with whatever time we have left. And I want to leave you with these verses. Colossians 3, 15 through 17. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called to one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us that we need to be guarding our hearts and our minds. We need to be diligent. We need to be loving one another. We need to be aware, Lord, that time is fleeting. Lord, give us that heart of wisdom that we would number our days. Lord, help us not to fear, but to live boldly for you. Lord, fill us with your love. Fill us with your spirit. Empower us to walk in your will for our lives. Lord, help us to be humble. Help us, Lord, to confess our sin and to have a clean heart and to worship you with every breath. Lord, you alone are worthy to be worshipped. You alone are worthy to be lived for. Help us to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.